Sorry, thank you. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, down to 2.10. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. But the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. That should give us a lot of confidence, shouldn't it? Um, that, that, that truth that Christ has been raised in, in such a way, such a height. And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the des desires of our flesh, sorry, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up, up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his, in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So I've taken from my text um, this, uh, this afternoon, today, Easter, uh, you he made alive. Uh, that's uh, verse one, of course, in, in chapter two. You he made alive. And it's this. Uh, it's, it's quite clear that uh, Paul's got a real grasp of uh, of these truths of which we've just been just been reading. Uh, they're, they're, they're wonderful. That they're, 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 they're really great truths, and they just flow out. And uh, I think he probably dictated them, but it didn't flow out of his pen. But it's, they just seem to flow out. They just so real to him, he just got such a, um, an understanding of, of these things. In fact, the verses one to 10 are just one sentence in the Greek. Mm -hmm. Now that perhaps gives an idea of just how it's just flowing out, flowing out from, from uh, Paul's heart. And it's good news, isn't it? It's really, really good news. Because we can see from, uh, from, uh, from what Paul's written here, just how bad things were for us. They were, at, they couldn't, be any any worse really in many ways but they're really bad but, e but equally what a wonderful work that God has done for us in, in lifting us out of that, uh, that terrible pit that uh, that we are in that pit which is so deep uh, and dark that we we couldn't get out there's no way that we could have got out except by the grace of God so we we were in desperate straits but, uh, but we've now been given life through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we need to remember as well that this isn't any uh, academic text which we're meant to uh, dissect. We can approach the Bible like that sometimes if we're not careful, but these are living truths that affect our lives. Uh, and these ones in particular just so absolutely profoundly. So it's not something to approach just academically. 
and it was a living reality for Paul. And he wanted the Ephesians or whoever he was writing to, um, to, uh, uh, to know about it. And of course, he, he wants us, he, want, he, he didn't know us, he didn't, he didn't know him, he didn't know you, he didn't know you, but he, but he would have wanted us to know as well, just uh, the, these truths as well. And he must have been so, maybe a bit, he might have been a bit surprised that his, we'll still be reading his letters 2,000 years later and learning from what he's written, but he must be very pleased to know it anyway, that uh, uh, the truths are still being uh, declared and held to as well. Uh, so I've said my text was, you he made alive, but actually you'll note that he made alive in, in verse one is actually in italic. So he doesn't actually say it at that point. It's not until, down, until he gets down to verse five that he really, is, he really says it. Uh, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So he's been working up to it that in those first four verses. He not actually said it in verse one, really. And uh, at the end of the uh, previous chapter, we've uh, it focused very much on um, on Christ, didn't it, and his resurrection and his exaltation. But in, in chapter two, he's now actually turning his attention to us. He's applying what what he's just said about Christ to us, how it affects us, because obviously it profoundly, profoundly affects uh, us. Now, uh, yeah, so for my, uh, for my sermon, I've got four main headings. What made alive means, how God made us alive, who God made alive, and God's purpose in making us alive. So let's start with the first one. What, uh, what what made alive means. So what does it mean to be made alive? Well, perhaps before we look at that, uh, maybe we'll look at the opposite, what it means to be dead uh, in trespasses and sins of, of, again, verse one of chapter two. And if we, under, if we can see, perhaps perceive something what it means to be dead in, in trespasses and sins, it may help us to appreciate the good news all the more. So uh, let's think just a little bit about what it means to be dead. And we don't need to be miserable about this, 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 and that are living in, in sins because it's all leading up to life, isn't it? It's not, it's, uh, it's not nice talking about death, but, um, but it's, it's leading up to something wonderful that God's done in comparison. So, uh, so, so what's the state of a dead person? Well, a, a physically dead person is unaware of what's going on. Now, life, life continues in his, for his family and, uh, and with everything that he was involved in when, when he was alive. But the thing about a dead person is he cannot participate in it. He's totally, a dead person is totally cut off from, from the life that he's, he or she's been, um, been living in. And so for good reason, that is the thing that everyone in, in the natural at least fears and strives against with all their being. It's, it's, it's even designed into our very nature by God really to to uh, to uh, avoid death, it's something uh, above all that we 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 want to avoid. No, because we, we think about the loss. The loss of being cut off from all those that we uh, know and love, our families, not being in contact with a familiar environment. No, we've lived might have lived seventy years or eighty years or more in uh, in a particular environment, and it's and uh, to be cut off, the fear of being cut off from, from that something so familiar, for something which we don't really quite understand you know especially if we're not christians uh that that it's it's a it's a something to shrink from really losing the ability to uh, to fulfill all our purposes and, and plans no i don't know about you but no we 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 well, some people at least have seem to have got quite strong ideas what they want to do with their lives maybe young people especially no i want to i want to see jerusalem i want to i want to see the pyramids or um, I want to see my children married and things. No, there's all sorts of different things which purpose and plans which fill our lives. And to be perhaps told, well, I'm sorry, but you're not going to see these things. It's not going to happen. It's again, it's, it's, it's a terrible thing. And of course, there's, you know, I've already touched on it, the unknown associated with death as well. So death's a terrible thing. And it gives can give us a bit of the shivers. Again, that's probably especially if we're... Um, if we're not Christians, but even with Christians, it's it's you know 
it's, it's not an easy thing to, uh, to face. But the Bible says that death is, is already the state of everyone who doesn't know Christ. But of course, it's a, it's a spiritual death, which when I say that, uh, and what the Bible, Bible speaks about it, uh, non-Christians are in, in a spiritual death. But nevertheless, all those things are spoke about physical death. In, in one sense, there's, there's corollaries with, uh, with, with, a, with a spiritual uh, death as well. God told Adam that if he ate of the tree of the uh, knowledge of good and evil, he would die. And he did die first spiritually, with the result that he hid from God, and then physically. And, and probably Adam had a, after the, after the fall, Adam probably had a better understanding of his loss than people in the world today, a non-Christian in the world today, because spiritual death isn't apparent to, uh, to people who are spiritually dead. They've never been alive. They've never been spiritually alive. They don't know what it's all about. They've got no, no idea. It relates to a sphere which we've absolutely uh, no experience of. And so they don't understand it and they don't value it. The world's oblivious. And, it, and it's in darkness. It's like, no, it's like the, a blind person who, uh, who's never seen, born blind. And it's got no concept, presumably, no concept, no real concept of, of sight. You can tell him all about it. You can explain to him what sight is and, and, and such like, but, uh, but for him to fully, at all fully conceive it, is, it must surely be, be beyond, beyond him. It, it, it remains, it's always gonna remain a mystery to him while, while he can't see. So, so that's a little bit about death really, not very nice, but um, Edward, we're leading up to life, so we don't dwell too much on that, but we weren't just dead, I'm sorry to say, it gets worse, and it does actually get worse than that in some respects, because uh, we were walking in trespasses and sins. The life we were living completely missed, the, as far as God was concerned, the life we were living completely missed the mark. Uh, we, we were missing, missing the way, absolutely completely, in darkness, and always, always failing to live as, as, uh, as, as we ought to. So, and, and of course, Paul is aware of this, and, and he brings he seeks to bring this home to the Ephesians and, and I guess to us uh, in verses two and three. And he gives three things which characterized our walk in trespasses and sins. And the first one I've got is it was according to the course of this world. This is verse two, chapter two, according to the course of this world. Uh, we, we could translate that phrase uh, according to the spirit of the age. Now, to me, at least, anyway, the, the, the spirit of the age is, um, is very much one of uh, seeking a pursuit of pleasure and, uh, and of lawlessness. But, uh, and I suppose different ages have different, different spirits of different ages. Uh, and I suppose different countries have, have got different emphasis on these things. But one thing is certain that um, for the world, uh, the trajectory of uh, the course of this world and the spirit of the age is always away from the gospel. It's always away from God and the gospel. And I know it's always towards destruction. So it's a terrible, again, it's a terrible thing. And uh, part of it, part of the course of, of this world is, um, well, the world makes itself gods. The world seems to like having a God, things to follow. We do, we need things to follow. We need some philosophy of life, something to, to guide us in life really. Uh, and, the, and the world makes gods for itself. But the, the gods that the world makes, of course, it are gods that are agreeable to the world, gods that flatter uh, the world. But the trouble is that any idol we set up, it rises up to control us in the end. And we end up serving our God, we end, our, the God we've made, and we, we end up serving the, 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 our idols instead of serving of them serving us. We set them up because we want them to serve us really in, in, in the real heart of things, but they don't. But they may seem benign at first, but we think if we follow them, then everything will be great, everything will be fine. And society, you will know, societies, if you follow society's norms and everything will go fine, everything will be great. Um, but it never ends up like that. An example of that is um, the God called 
freedom. The God freedom seems to be a good God and uh, is very pleasant. And uh, he or she lets us decide our own laws and, and our own morality. And that's really, really very kind of this, of this God freedom. Uh, and, and, and he says, he says, I don't know if he's a he or a she, but anyway, um, it says that there's no need for religion. You can cast religion off. No, it only restricts you. It makes unreasonable demands on you. In, in the modern age, you've outgrown religion. If you follow freedom, though, you'll be free. And that'll be good, it'll be great. And so what we've got now is a secular society, largely a secular society. And we've got new rules, new laws that apply. The old national laws, which were based on revelation on, on the word of God, they're being replaced, largely have been replaced, with, with um, society's uh, laws. But, um, but the God of freedom, he, 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 he starts to impose all sorts of twisted ideas on society, which destroy lives. Because uh, freedom, will it, just for some examples, it, it kills children in the womb. The major cause of death in the world, 55% of deaths, uh, I've been told recently, uh, uh, worldwide are, are caused through um, through abortion. Mm. It's a huge number. You no, know, we, we, we're making a big fuss about COVID and things like that, but there's no comparison. And cancer, no, it's not. It, it, it's it's death of the children in the womb. This is in this is the God's freedom. He's he's he's, he's, he's allowed that. You no, know, because he says, well, women should be free to choose what happens to their own bodies. Kills marriage as well. So bringing same-sex marriage. And of course, that undermines the true meaning of marriage. And when you start undermining that, well, I don't know where it's going to end up. Kills free speech. You now we've got what's called the cancel culture now. And uh, tolerance. Uh, tolerance is such a wonderful thing, isn't it? And it is in many ways. But uh, And it's trumpeted by society. But uh, and our society loves tolerance, provided it doesn't cut across the world's values. But as soon as it does, then, sorry, no, tolerance disappears. Because you know, decent, decent people lose their jobs. Decent people get sidelined. They get cancelled out of society. So that's the sort of thing that ends up when, where we end up when we follow the course of this world. And we're all on, we were all on that course at one time. We we're all pursuing that. We we're all encouraging others in the world, by example, if not by word, to, to follow the, the same course. And uh, we um, were guilty of... of well, undermining society, destroying society. So sins, trespasses, they're, they're, they're a serious matter. But now, of course, we're, 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 we in the church, we, we need to guard ourselves. We know these things. So we need to guard ourselves. And we need to perhaps consider what things influence us now. We were influenced by the world. We were dominated by the world. But what influences us now? Of course, word of God influences, and I'm, I've no doubt that is the major influence in our life. It doesn't mean it's the only influence in our life. It doesn't mean the world's still not got its tentacles uh, around our hearts and minds in, in some respects. And we need to make sure that, uh, well, we need to think. We need to think, you know, what, what influences us now? What, who influences us? Uh, what's, what's their nature? What's the nature of the influences? Now we need to ask ourselves what our interests are. What do we spend our time on? These things might give us some clues as to maybe there's some things which, um, which, are, which are pulling us back into the, the ways of the world. So we need, to, we need to stand our ground, not be pressed into the world's mold. And because the world is very persistent as well, even though we may be struggling and fighting and looking into the word of God and seeking to escape the clutches of the world. It's always there, it's always got this pressure on us, always trying to pull us back. Uh, and conform us to, the, to, to its course, and we can't afford that because we're meant to be salt and light in this world. And if we're not, if salt loses its taste, what use is it? Praise God, though, we've got a new nature, and that makes all the difference. And uh, we, we recognise, we can recognise, um, and separate ourselves from uh, from the ways of the world. So that that was the um, that's the first of the three things that Paul mentions. But the, the uh, second one is, um, it's according to the prince of the power, we were, our trespasses and sins were according to the prince of the power of the air. 
you know, the, the, the direction of our lives as we followed the course of this world, it wasn't, it wasn't just, it wasn't only that it was wrong, but, um, but it was positively directed by the prince of the power of the air, by the devil himself, ultimately. And we were energized by the, uh, the powers of evil. It's not a nice thought, is it? But, but that, is, that is the case. It was according to the prince of the power of the air. We thought we did think ourselves free, uh, but we're still strongly influenced by the, uh, by the powers of darkness. And of course, you know that the devil, he wants to kill and steal and destroy. So just our, our being influenced by the devil obviously leads to, um, to again, terrible things. So in sin, uh, dead in trespasses and sins, our walk was, is a very serious matter. And then the third thing Paul gives was um, it, our walk was according to the lusts of the flesh and the mind. Uh, I, I was reading through Proverbs at the moment. There's quite a lot in Proverbs actually about um, desires of the flesh and warning against them. And it's a very practical book, and it's it's good because it, it warns us against the against the um, the, uh, the various passions of, of the flesh and highlights consequences. I mean, even ju just a simple example uh, is: He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. He who loves pleasure will be a poor man. Uh, there's consequences, there's consequences of, of the lust of the flesh and the mind. When did we, by the way, when did we last have a, a sermon on Proverbs? We don't, don't get many. Um, something to think about. Uh, uh, so the lust of the flesh and lust of the mind as well. We don't so much think about this, perhaps. Uh, we, we need to be warned that our, uh, our rational thinking is fallen as well. As, as our emotions and desires. And, and we, we might think that science is exempt from the fall because after all, it's based on uh, observed facts and, uh, and deductions. Uh, but just think about ev evolution, it's a good example. It's, it's absolutely plain, at least to me, that um, the evidence doesn't support evolution at all. And uh, the, whole, the whole of creation shouts intelligent design. But how is it? Intelligent science, you know, people at the top of their field, they, they still hold fast to evolution, contrary to all sense and, and science, in fact. Uh, so, so we need to be aware. Our, our thinking was also corrupted by, by, by the fall. Another example is, uh, is the danger of formulating doctrine on the basis of assumptions and deductions from what we read in the word of God. Now, obviously, we've got to make some, we've got to use our, we've got to use our thinking, it's got to be sanctified thinking, um, but we can make assumptions and we can make um, certain deductions which actually may not turn out to be right, because at the end of the day, they're only deductions, they're not the clear statement of, of what the Word of God says. Uh, for me, pre-tribulation um, rapture springs to mind, because I, I, to me at least, sorry about this, but um, I, uh, to me, that, that is based on assumptions and deductions, because there's no, no real clear teaching, no near, clear statement of, of it at all. And, we, and yet we make a very big um, thing about it. And then, of course, there's Peter as well. His, his worldly sense made him take Jesus aside one day. Jesus has been speaking to, speaking to his disciples, teaching them and telling them that he, he's going to have to die and then he'd be raised. But Peter, through his natural thinking, uh, I thought no, no, this is this isn't right. You can't. How how can you, why why let why let them kill you? Why why do it? It doesn't make sense. We need you, perhaps. And so he very um, kindly took Jesus aside and explained to him why Jesus was wrong and he shouldn't do it. But um, Jesus had to rebuke Peter uh, and told him he was mindful of the things of men rather than the things of God. A perfectly reasonable deduction on Peter's part, but it was just plain wrong, absolutely completely wrong, because he didn't understand, he didn't know, he didn't know the full counsel of God. So our thinking needs to be submitted to the Lord and energized by the Holy Spirit rather than the prince of the power of the air, like Jesus uh, said Peter was being influenced by, because God's ways aren't our ways. His ways are so much higher than, than our ways, and deductions and things will never get us to, um, to a full understanding of, of, of the ways of God. Our thinking needs to be renewed. 
And then, so, so Paul gave us those three, the Ephesians, those three um, characteristic, characteristics of our, of our walk, and trespasses and sins. But then he summarizes the characteristics with the awful statement that we were by nature children of wrath. And that's an awful statement. But we deserved it. We deserved the wrath of God for the way we'd been walking. Uh, we were, but we were by nature children of wrath. Now, when something is part of your nature, what can you do about it? How do you escape it? It's so hard. It's so difficult. In fact, maybe it's even impossible. How, how can you change? You might want to change. You may not like your nature, but um, but you can't change. You try and you try and you can't. It doesn't. Good resolves, uh, personal discipline. Um, good works never can never change your nature. Can't they, they, can, they can't change the fact that uh, our nature, that by nature, we were children of wrath. And then, of course, there was Jonathan Edwards, wasn't there? The um, American, the well-known uh, in his well-known gospel message, he, he, he sought to awaken the people to uh, to their danger for the wrath of God on their lives. You know, he spoke about their their lives hanging by a thread, dangling over the fires of hell. And that's a right description of how we were, and millions and billions of people in the world are right now. Uh, maybe even somebody listening to this uh, sermon now or later uh, might uh, might be in that place. And how easy it is for that hair just to snap and and fall, and and uh, and uh, and that's it. We fall. Now there's there's COVID, there's accidents, there's war, and even if you have to wait till you're 90 or 95 or 100, death comes in the end. And hair breaks and we're irre irredeemably gone and lost forever. We were children of wrath. It's, it's, it's a serious matter. But yeah, thank God though that there is a, there's, a, there's a way of escape from his, from his wrath. Uh, there's, there's an escape from walking in sin. And surprisingly, God directed his, um, his wrath against his own son instead, whom he sent into the world for that very reason. Jesus was sent into the world to, to, to deal with this wrath of God, which uh, was looming over us. And he planned that, that his son would take the punishment for our sins, that we might be saved from death and our trespasses and sins. So, and God acted and he made us alive. So we're back. We're back to the good news and we're back to my text again. You he made alive. We're not dead, we're alive. God's made us alive. So what does it mean to be alive then in contrast to being dead in trespasses and sins? Well, uh, whereas death is to be cut off from our familiar environment, to be made alive means to gain a, an awareness of a new environment, the things of the spirit, heavenly things, there's a whole new world that's opened up to us when we became Christians, when we were born again. The heavenly realms where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, they've, they've become, they've become a, a familiar sphere to us. It's like newborn babies. Now, I don't, don't really know an awful lot about babies, to be honest. I, apparently I was one. I got no, can't prove that, but I think I was one. And I don't, don't really remember. But... Um, um, but no, when we're first born in, and um, placed in, in the parent mother's arms or father's arms, um, we, we start, I think we, we start to drink in the world, to start to drink in the world around us. And at first it's very hazy in the baby's eyes, they don't quite focus right. Uh, I can correct me if I got this wrong, um, Laura or, or, or Stefano. <laughs> Uh, but the baby perhaps only sees light and, and shapes uh, at very first. But then the revelation expands and, and, they, and they start to see and start recognising the face of their parent, parents. And that revelation keeps on expanding and they begin to focus better and see more and more and, and, and remember things. They've seen, oh, I've seen that before, that face, I've seen that face before. Oh, it's my mum. Well, they don't use those words, but... <laughs> uh, and uh, so... So, so the, the, the baby's uh, revelation uh, uh, expands and expands. It's the same with us. Uh, our revelation should be expanding and expanding. And it's up to us to make sure that, um, uh, that we, we keep, 
keep working on spiritual things, keep expand, uh, um, looking into the word of God and prayer and um, fellowship. All these things help us to become mature and expand our revelation. But uh, when our eyes, are, our eyes are open to spiritual things, the first thing that we should become aware of, and we do become aware of, is, is God himself, when well, he's our parent, but God himself and his son, Jesus Christ. In fact, this is the definition of eternal life. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And of course, is in John 17. That's the definition of eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And of course, Paul's prayer for us, uh, which we read in uh, verse 17 of chapter 1 of Ephesians, was uh, uh, that, we'd, that we'd have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, because he wants our revelation to increase. That's what he was, he was praying for. And yeah, Paul prayed for, um, for the Ephesians according to, to his prayer, that prayer. In fact, there's another prayer as well, isn't there, in Ephesians? Um, because he wanted our knowledge of God to grow in particular. And when, when our knowledge of God grows, then everything starts to change. And so that's, that's why I know that this Paul, prayer of Paul is probably one of the best things that we can pray for one another. So as we increase in the knowledge of God, well, we follow less and less the course of this world. And uh, we're less and less influenced by, by the devil, more and more and more by God himself. And we're controlled less and less by the lusts of the flesh and mind. And the whole course of our lives turns around. This is our experience when we're born again. Straight away, we start to change when we've really been born again. All, the whole course of our lives starts to turn around. Uh, I've said before that um, as, as soon as I became a Christian, I stopped believing in evolution. I mean, I wasn't a strong believer in it. I never really thought much about it, but that's a, it's still a big step to believing in creation, nevertheless, isn't it? And yet, no trouble whatsoever, because it's a work of the Holy Spirit, and he gives revelation, gives understanding. We're just transformed by, um, by the Spirit of God and, and, and by, by the Word of God. And that's why um, repentance is, well, to my mind, repentance always precedes going on with God. Because it's, it's always when we turn away from something that we can turn away, turn toward God and to the things of God and, and, um, and uh, go, on, go on with him. And so, yeah, as we're, when we're born again, it's as if jumbled sets of jigsaw pieces start to get set in place and things come into harmony in our lives. Uh, and we know where, where we are and, um, and we gain a true sense of, of purpose because we've got revelation, we've got real genuine understanding rather than just some ad hoc um, guess at uh, what life's really all about. We know what life's about now. It's been revealed to us. And this is all as a direct result of our increase, increasing our, in our knowledge of God. In fact, nothing has got any meaning. Not, there's no order to anything uh, except in relation to, uh, to God himself. So we start, uh, so part of the whole process is that the word of God comes, to comes alive to us and our minds get renewed and we start to think differently. Romans 12, 2 says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's really important that we renew our minds because our actions are determined very much by how we think. What we think determines why we do certain things. People always have a reason why they do things, even though it seems crazy, things actions seem crazy to people. There's always a reason behind it. And that, that is because of how, what we're thinking, that, that determines our actions. So we need to make sure that our thinking is right. And so as we, as we read the word of God and our minds are renewed, we start to fulfill the purposes of God and, and the plans that God's got for us. And that is what will bring us into the richest of uh, fulfillments in life, the richest fulfillment possible. So that was my first point. That's quite a long one, but um, a bit shorter now. Second point was um, how did God, how God made us alive, uh, and 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 how how have our lives been transformed? 
because what how can that which is dead be made alive it's not normal it's not normal in in, in, the, in the physical uh and certainly in the spiritual what can the world do to bring us into spiritual life there's no conceivable way that earthly things can give birth to spiritual things it's just it's not in uh, earthly things to do it because the earth is not spiritual well we're alive in virtue of the fact that jesus has been made alive and this goes back to um ephesians 1 19 to 21 let me read it again and what is the and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places far above all principalities principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also that in which is to come so the foundation is um, christ being raised from the dead by the by the exceeding greatness of, of of his power of god's power uh, but also that but that that was christ that's the foundation but applying it to us uh, in verses five and six of ephesians 2 even when we were dead in trespasses made us alive together with christ by grace you've been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in christ jesus so we're made alive but in virtue of the fact that we're made alive together with christ and i tried to stress that it says together to together together in those those two verses in ephesians 2 it's all together with christ that is the only way we had ever we ever entered into life the virtue that he's been raised from the dead and we were raised with him and it's no wonder perhaps that we we say that uh, the christian life is a relationship because how can we live apart from christ we've been raised with him we're in christ we're seated with him in the heavenly places uh, there's this such an intimate uh, connection between us and 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 Christ. And we say that the marriage relationship is a very close relationship. And of course, I think is it in is it in Ephesians or elsewhere? One of the other letters it talks about it says that Ephesians that uh, marriage is um, is a picture of a relationship with, with with Christ. So if Jesus hadn't been raised, neither could we have been. There's no way we could have been raised apart, raised apart from, from Christ. And so that is why Easter is on the Christian calendar. It was such a momentous day when Christ was raised from the dead. It was a momentous day for me. It was a momentous day for you. And it's a momentous day for the whole world because it opened up the possibility that everybody, at least the possibility, those who respond in faith, could be raised with Christ and have this new life, could could enter into a spiritual realm which just had no idea about before and be delivered from death and trespasses and sins and if there's anything greater than that I, I don't know what it is there's nothing greater than that surely so that was my second point now my, my third ma third major point was um who he made alive or uh go my go back to my test text you he made alive so who is you in you he made alive well, uh, Paul goes on uh, later in the chapter to talk about Jew and Gentile, and, and it, um, the, um, this new life is for Jew uh, and Gentile. And I think that covers everybody, doesn't it, really? The gospel's for everyone. I was watching a, a short video. Uh, this is, in fact, is provided by um, somebody which Philip met in India, a friend he's got in India, who's um, he's an evangelist, and I think he's a pastor, he's a pastor now as well. And uh, he sends us this, this video of um, them evangelizing this village. And of course, it's so different in India from here. Um, and it, it, it's a video, it shows them turning up in their um, trailer and, and, and giving these things out and preaching to them. But of course, it's all very different. Um, um, and it's a village, no, but they, they didn't know the name of Jesus' village. And there's a lot of villages there probably which haven't heard the, the name of Jesus. Uh, and so the video showed their huts, no thatched huts, obviously very poor people. Uh, and then, so that's, but in contrast, we can look at ourselves in our houses and um, 
and uh, no, we, 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 we've got brick houses and, and we've got lots of relative absolute wealth. Uh, of course, everybody in the world's different ages as well, and um, there's some and some some old. The um, in the video, some of these villages just to show two ladies. One was um, 105, and the other one was 107. Now that's a bit surprising because you think, well, you know, these villages in India they'd be poor and it's all grotty and they'd probably die when they're 60. Well, it sounds like that's not actually true. Maybe they've got quite healthy lives there. Um, well, the gospel, the point I'm trying to make in all this is, is the gospel is for young and old, it's, it's for um, people in this country who are rich and it's for people who are poor, it's people who've got, um, just wearing blue jumpers or grey jumpers, <laughs> uh, and it's also for people who've got brightly coloured clothes in, in, in India, you know, with reds and golds and, and things, and different languages, everybody, and different, way, again, different ways of thinking perhaps, different um different different everyone, everyone everyone in the world is different but the gospel is is for everybody and it's able to reach everybody we're, we're very we're very diverse nobody absolutely nobody in this world is excluded from being trans, transformed by by the grace of god uh and sharing in that resurrection life of christ and of course, we know that the gospel has got to be preached to every uh, nation, tribe, tongue, and people, in every class, rich, poor, clever, and not so clever. And we can all become members of the body of Christ. It's going to be amazing, isn't it, if uh, when we gather together in heaven. I don't know if the Indians will be wearing Indian clothes and we'll be wearing our blue jumpers. But um, so, uh, but but um, it's, it's going to be a right collection and be short people and tall people and young and old. Uh, amazing, I mean, amazing. Uh, but we all come together in Christ, and nothing can unite like the gospel, because the gospel, uh, unity based on the gospel, is it's not based on anything in the world. The world changes; it's it's a, it's a mobile. Everything's changing in the world. Nothing, nothing stays the same. But uh, but in Jesus Christ, He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And there's one truth. There's one faith. One truth. Uh, one baptism, and uh, we've all shared in that, and and, and we, we have that unity. And then my final point was uh, God's purpose in making us alive. What does the passage say in Ephesians about uh, God's purpose in, in making us alive? Uh, it's important to notice because if God's gone to the trouble of sending his son into this world and, and dying for us, being raised, raising us with him, a wonderful plan worked out by only God could have thought of this plan, only God could have carried out, only God could have been willing to carry it out. Uh, it's important that his purpose should be fulfilled and, and to the full. Well, there's two things that uh, Paul gives us in, in, this, uh, in those verses we read. And the first one is to show God, for God to show his nature is a abounding, overflowing riches of, of, of his nature. Uh, Ephesians 2, 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show, sorry, that in the ages to come, he might show in the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. My commentary says, uh, the church is to be the exhibition to the whole creation of the wisdom and love and grace of God in Christ. And this word show, uh, is, it can be translated uh, display or exhibit. It doesn't mean to make known the, uh, the grace of God. I guess in the ages to come, we'll know about it. We'll already know about it. Um, but it's to exhibit it. And that's slight, subtly different from, from just, just making it known. Now, when you've got a, 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 there's going to be a permanent exhibition um, in heaven when, we get, when we're there uh, in the ages to come. And it's going to display the, the kindness shown to an undeserving people. And we're going to be that exhibition. Uh, and it's going to be one of those exhibitions that uh, you'll want to go and see again and, and again in eternity. And not just us, but the angels and any other created beings that might be inhabiting um, uh, the heavenly places. Uh, they're going to see us as well. Uh, 
and uh, no, you go around the exhibition and, and you're going and you're going to come out praising God and wanting to go back in again. You know, we could run around to the entrance again uh, and, and have another look and come out again praising God. So that that was um, the first of the of the two reasons why God has um, um, has um, uh, has, um, has has made us alive. And the other one is that uh, well that that one that uh, the one I just mentioned really that, that's okay. We've made a response to the gospel, and we just need to stand for the gospel so that we're there, so that we're ready there to be set up <laughs> in, in the exhibition. But um, but uh, the second one is to walk in good works, and this is where we need to be a bit more active at the moment, perhaps uh, in, in this world. Um, Ephesians two ten it says, uh, "For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works." which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, oh, Titus also, uh, 2.14 says, uh, he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, uh, that's our trespasses and sins, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So we don't just want to do good works. We want, we want to be zealous. We should be zealous for, uh, for good works. We need to be aware that the vestiges of the old life don't continue to cling to us because they're going to make us unfit for, uh, for, for God's service, for good works. The tentacles of this world's attitudes, they, 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 permeate, they probably permeate more, than, uh, more of our thinking than we realise, as I've probably already said. And the lusts of the flesh and the ways of the world will always be contrary to the good works that God has prepared for us. So set free from them, we'll, we'll be free to do the works, that the, the good works that God has prepared for us. Because the old life certainly doesn't prepare us for, for God's service. The, 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 uh, it's only the new life, as we live in the new life and, and we're renewed, that, and, we, and, and we put away the old life, that uh, we'll be equipped for service for God. Of course, the world's full of good works of its own devising. And, and they look really good again, and they can make a good long list of all the good things that um, uh, the, the world's devised. And uh, but these are just many of them anyway. Are just the court. They're not biblical. They're not things that God necessarily would would endorse. They're things of, of, of the world's endorsing. And the world and, and the world congratulates itself on its own righteousness in following these things. Uh, but we've got to do the good works that spring out of a godly life. No, if, if, if we concentrate first of all on a, on a godly life and our relationship with the Lord, then um, what will spring out of that is 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 good. The good is 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 the good works that God wants us to do. The ones that God wants us to walk in. So instead of walking in um, trespasses and sins, we'll be walking in in the works that God good works that God has chosen for us and set for us to do. And just a practical note on that point, um, if we want to do good works, so we need to be engaged with people. We need to have, and, and, and people's situations, we need relationship with people, because so often good works relate to people. When we're sitting on our armchairs in the lounge on our own, you, you don't know needs in the world, you, you don't know what's going on, you can't, and even if you did, you can't help them because no, they're outside the four walls. So um, probably the more we engage with people, the more relationship we have with people, the more good works, we'll be, we'll be in a better place to uh, carry out uh, good works. So in summary, being alive means that we're no longer controlled by the world, the flesh and the devil. And the old influences of our past life have dropped away completely. Uh, it's, uh, in fact, we, we, we've died to them. No, just as death cuts us off from, from, uh, from the physical world, physical death cuts us from the physical world, it, really, I suppose, we, we've died to the old life and we've been cut off in one sense from, from, from all the old ways uh, that we might live in the new. And we're no longer children of wrath, but we're recipients of the exceeding riches of his grace. Uh, it says, exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus, verse 7. And we've come into a whole new sphere where the most significant thing is that living relationship 
with God, the God who has actually sent his son to die for us, and that living relationship with, 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 with Christ, who, who actually obeyed the Father, and he came as willing to die for us. As I said, nobody else would have been willing to do it. We couldn't have done it. We couldn't have chosen to do it. Even if we could have done it, we wouldn't have wanted to do it. It'd be too fearsome for us. We wouldn't have, wouldn't have been able to do it. Uh, and so we've got a relationship with, with a God who is exceedingly gracious, loving, merciful God. And uh, that is one of the, that is perhaps the fruit of, of um, being made alive. And we've got new purpose in life as well, uh, to serve God in the good works he's prepared for us. And uh, well, and also I said as well, didn't I, that it's for everyone. And it's good to remember it's for everyone because maybe that will stimulate us to perhaps look a little bit wider in our, in our, out, in our out, outreach. Every tribe, tongue, people, nation, Jew, Gentile. Uh, the only restriction, I suppose, on the grace of God is um, that it's, it only reaches to sinners. It's only sinners who can benefit from the grace of God. Those who um, persist in their righteousness, sadly, will keep their own righteousness, but it'll be found to be um, inadequate at the day. So let's let's cast aside all our self, all, all our own righteousness, anything we try and justify ourselves with, anything we um, we try to sell our conscience with, or or even dare I say it, try and please God, uh, please God with to make Him accept us. We should hate such such thoughts, they, they should be completely alien to us when God in Christ has uh, done it all for us and, and he's made us, made us alive. So just last thought to leave with you is that um, basically God's been so gracious to us, we need to live this life to the full. He's given us fullness of life. It's not just ordinary life, it's fullness of life, about abundant life, and we should be seeking to uh, live it to the full. Amen and thank you Lord.